Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do encourage you to pick up our new Famous Investigator t-shirt. It is available as a regular premium tee, lady slim fit tee, youth tee, and a pullover hoodie. And you can pick that up over at famous.greatdetectives.net. Now it is time for this week's adventure with Sam Spade. The original air date, August 22nd, 1948, and the title is The Vafio Cup Keeper. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Detective Agency. That is the correct answer. You have just won $104 million, six deep freeze units, a stable of polo ponies with matching saddle soap, a terry cloth robe with chocolate bars pre-melted into the pockets, and a full-size, real, honest-to-goodness dreadnought such as is used by Uncle Sam's Navy. Oh, I'm sorry you'll have to call back. I'm expecting to be taking dictation from my employer very shortly. Oh, I am sorry. Your time is up. And Edna St. Vincent Markowitz, who sent in the question, gets bumped off in front of the studio audience gathered in the Dredgewood room here in Columbia Square. Next night, don't answer your phone, stupid. Oh, Sam. Let's have no coaching, please. Oh, did you find the cop? Was it murder? Was it really worth some... Well, you know, priceless and like that, and was it fun? Yes, 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 and no. And finally, are you kidding? Well, then why was it called the Vapio Cup? It's a very old Greek expression, which is what I'll be wearing as I sit in your lap dictating my report on the Vapio Cup caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Remember the Romeo of yesteryear? Hair parted in the middle, all plastered down? Man, what a difference today. Today, all a guy has to do to impress a gal is use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. If you're still using old-fashioned hair tonics, or none at all, then for her sake, spruce up today with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. In bottles or the handy new tube, it's again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Date, uh, August 22nd, 1948, to uh, Jethro Chiswick, Esquire. Oh, spelling, Sam. Uh, E-S-Q-U... No, Sam, I meant the name. It's, um, Chisro Jethwick. I did not say Chisro Jethwick. I said Jethro Chithwick. I mean, Chithro... Uh, uh, look, we'll check it later. Oh, Sam, it might... I have an uncle in Berkeley named Smithwick. Leave your family out of this, Eph. But he's only by marriage, Sam. It's quite a common name. Name three people named Chiswick. No, Smithwick. Now, let's see, there's Uncle George and Aunt Amelia by a previous marriage. Then there's my cousin Rupert on the Christie side. When you have finished ruminating amongst the foliage of your family tree, Miss Perrine. Well, I only mentioned it in connection right, with that name we'll that you thought you... all over again. Tear out that page. Yes, Your Highness? No, no, please. No need to curtsy. Uh, to uh, Jethro Chiswick, no comment, please. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. <clears throat> What's that? Nothing. Subject, the Vafio Cupcaper. Dear Commodore, that's the way I like you. Meek. 
I had always considered myself fairly well-versed in the subject of cups. But if anybody had told me there was such a thing as a Bafio cup, they could have knocked me over with one, which they did. Mr. Spade? Yeah. I'm Chester A. Brody. I talked with your secretary on the phone. Do you follow? Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Brody. Sit down. Rest your package. Thank you. I prefer to hold it for the time being. My card, sir. Theophilus and Brody, importers and exporters, mm mm-hmm. Mr. Theophilus is my partner, Dimitri Theophilus. Do you follow? I follow. It was Mr. Theophilus who brought the Vafio Cup into the firm. I furnished the cash capital. Vafio Cup, I do not follow. Yes, indeed. The only one of these treasures to fall into private hands. One of the fabulous Vafio Cups. Those exquisite and cunningly wrought examples of the art of the ancient Grecian goldsmith. Excavated by the great Schliemann from a beehive tomb in Sparta. Hmm, beehive. Mycenaean age. Just west of the Lion Gate. Oh, the Lion Gate. Uh, pardon me, uh, Mr. Brody. Are you trying to tell me that this cup is very valuable? Priceless. And that you will finally manage to find a buyer? You follow? And that you want me to deliver that package containing your priceless cup and return with your customer's cash? Accurately put. I presume you're bonded. Uncork me and see for yourself. <laughs> you are a droll fellow, to be sure. I had a light breakfast, drolls and coffee. Now, uh, what is this uh, Vafio cup? I will show it to you. You're about to see a treasure but few eyes have looked upon in our time, Mr. Spade. The Vafio Cup. Handle it carefully. It's fragile. You could crush it in your hand like so much tinfoil. Yet this golden relic of a golden age has come down through the centuries miraculously unscathed. Note the delicately wrought lines of the bas-relief. The exquisite draperies on the figure of the caryatid. The anguish on the face of the fallen hunter. The sheer brute force of the wild boar charging to the kill. Holding this golden cup in your hands, you encompass 3,000 years. Do you comprehend why there's no question of insurance here? Frankly, I don't. My dear man, an item such as this is worth only as much as a collector will pay for it. This particular collector has offered $200,000. It might never be offered again. You follow? I follow. Very well. Here's your fee, $100. I follow. And here is the address of my client in Los Angeles, Commodore Jethro Chiswick. Oh, now, wait a minute. You will take the noon train. Any questions? Yeah, why can't I go on a plane? Because I've placed an item in this afternoon's papers to the effect that the treasure is to be transported by plane. If I were a gun, if I read that item, I'd uh, take the train. That would be your first thought. Then you would think they're saying they're taking the plane to make me think they're taking the train. Therefore, you would take the plane after all. Oh, would you? If you were really clever, you might say they're taking the plane to make one think it's the train, so I'll take the plane after all, and therefore... Never mind. By this time, he's decided on the bus. The train is perfectly safe. You follow? The package was light in the drawing room, and the train was comfortable. Seemed like an easy way to earn a hundred bucks. I knew it wouldn't last. Never does. I was prepared for the knock on the door, and I got ready for the inevitable small, dark man who plays the Peter Lorre part, but this one fooled me. He was a tall, thin actor with sandy hair. Okay, Shamus, hand over the package. You won't be no trouble. Sure, there it is on the seat. Take it. Huh? It's okay. You got me covered. I won't make any move. Hey, what are you trying to pull? It's a stick-up, isn't it? Hey, maybe I got the wrong compartment. No, that's it. The cup's in there. Unwrap it and see for yourself. Oh, no, you don't. I ain't picking up no booby traps. Oh, you're yellow, huh? <laughs> I know that one, too. I don't cut no ice for me. Suit yourself. Game of gin? Hey, you're nuts. I'm getting out of here. Hey, wait a minute, pal. I'll buy you a drink. I don't drink. Lunch? In a go. <laughs> yes, indeed, Mr. Spade. I agree. Clarence is a very comical fellow. So are you. I took the liberty of stepping into your forecastle whilst you had your bit of railway in the after companionway with my mate, dear Clarence. You mind? Uh, not at all. Well, sir, I'm afraid you're going to mind a great deal. Oh. And that's how I met you, Commodore. I was so busy sizing up the 45 in your right hand that I didn't even notice when you left whipped out of your coat pocket with one of the largest saps I have ever felt. The next time I saw light, you were gone, the Vafio Cup was gone, and the train was pulling into San Jose. I got off, rode back to San Francisco with a truckload of chickens, and headed straight for my client's apartment. You 
out here quick. Yeah. Come in. Thanks. <clears throat> well? Well, what? Look, uh, we can't both play this dead man. We'll stay in no place. It's in the back room. What is? The body. You're from the police, aren't you? I'm a private dick. How dare you? Hey, what was that for? For spying on me. You and all the other cheap gumshoes my husband hires. You're Mrs. Brody? I'm Enid Theophilus. Didn't the meet... Did my husband hire you? My name is Sam Spade. I was hired by one Chester A. Brody, your husband's business partner. Well, Sam, I hope he paid you in advance, because he's the body. Chester A. Brody was just barely identifiable. Somebody had worked hard trying to persuade him to say or do something he either couldn't or wouldn't do. The only interesting clue was in the wastebasket. At first, I thought it was a flattened beer can. But it was the Vafio cup, or a facsimile thereof. Well, how do you like it, Sam? I don't. He was my client. I wasn't hired to protect him. I didn't like him, but he was my client. How would you like me for a client? I'll give you the name of a lawyer, sister. My name is Enid. Enid? Now, let's see what I can squeeze out of you before the cops do. Brody was your husband's business partner, and you're, uh... You don't have to be subtle. He was mad about me. I'm... I'm all broken up about his death. So was he. That wasn't funny. That time I deserved it. You don't like me, do you? Can't you get it through that steel-jacketed brain of yours that you're in bad trouble, that there's a dead man in the next room beaten to death and you're not supposed to be here? Oh, I was supposed to be here. We were going to elope as soon as you brought back the money from that uh, Greek thing. Yeah, what about that Greek thing? It was an antique. It was called the Vafio Cup. Yes, I know about that. Yes. Well, my husband dug it up in Greece and smuggled it into the country. Yeah? It was all he had, but it was such an important piece that he was able to persuade Chet, um, the late Chester Brody, that is, to let him in as a full partner. Then what? Well, they quarreled. My husband made some bad investments, and Chet wanted to sell the cup to save the firm. Dimitri refused. I didn't think it was fair, so I got the keys to his safety deposit box where the cup was, and Chet arranged to sell it to the Commodore. Did, uh, did you get the money from the Commodore? All I got from the Commodore was lumps. He stole the cup? Roger. You've got to get it back. I've got it. Where? Here, take a look. <gasps> it's ruined. Where did you find it? In a trash basket where it belongs. Dimitri did it. He must have suspected something and substituted a fake. That's it. He knows where the real one is. Somebody thought that your boyfriend knew. The one that killed him? That's the way it looks. Maybe that's the way it was meant to look. You know, somebody might get the idea that you palmed the genuine when you got it out of that safety deposit box. If I did, it was legal, and don't you forget it. A wife can't steal from her husband. Legally, they're one person you can't steal from yourself. That's the law. I was wrong. You don't need a lawyer. Will you help me? I may hurt you, and it'll cost you anyway. I know what's good for me. Money. Find that cup. <laughs> I know what's good for me, too. So I uh, took her hundred bucks, advised her to go home, and made for my own humble lodging. They were not only humble, they were crowded. The man was small, but the gun was enormous. I said, uh, don't bother to introduce yourself. Your name is Dimitri Theopolis, and you want this package that I'm carrying. Makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before... Get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. 
It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Bafio Cup Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. He didn't answer me, so I said it again. Uh, don't bother to introduce yourself. Your name is Dimitri Theopolis, and you want this package that I'm carrying. Of that be assured. You obtained this from my dear wife. And how did you find my darling? Not at the city pond, surprisingly enough. Oh, you know my dear wife. How soon you know my darling so well, more than I, her husband. <laughs> is it possible? I don't know, is it? I don't know either. I employ a detective. Not this one. I have need. My poor partner, Mr. Brody. You are interested. If you are interesting about who killed your partner, that's one thing. But if you want somebody to dig out your family secrets, that is nothing. With me, you are, shall we say, no place. But why don't I got the right to know? There'll be no trouble, no scandal, no divorcement suing. Of that be assured. Even poor Chester is dead, so... He's what one calls ancient history. While he lived, I knew nothing. I was blind. After he died, I see certain things. Yeah, well, uh, do you see that maybe your wife had a hand in Brody's death? What then? Well, if it so happens that you cannot separate my darling from that, uh, do you follow? Not quite. Ah. I'm not an old man. Oh, but my that. dear wife is but two and twenty and a truly lovely person. Yeah, she's all right. Uh, would it not be the part of husbandly wisdom to have, uh, shall I say, uh, a hold over her? If she's guilty, you won't need it. Good. <laughs> Please, I cannot hold the gun and handle my wallet at the same time. Please. Uh, no, thanks. You keep the gun, I'll take the wallet. Oh, you trust me. You will work for me. Yeah, I'll work for anybody. <laughs> Here, I... Uh, Left your cab. Oh, you. assuredly, you are so very kind. Oh, I'm not so Now the pocket, yes? No. The, then I don't hesitate to suit you. Now, wait a minute. Yes? This is the fake. You sure you want this? Assuredly, yes. A man has already been killed for it. Your life's a high price to pay for a fake, though fancy, tin cup. You still think that's the price? Brother, I know it. Then you know I will kill you for it. Okay, if it means that much to you, and I guess it does, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, please remain where you are. If you follow me, I will surely suit you. From my front window, I watched them come out downstairs and start across the street. Then it happened. I saw the gun flash as it fired, and Theophilus slumped to the pavement. The package slid away from him into the gutter. I beat it down to him. He'd taken all three pellets in the midsection from close range. His pulse fluttered once or twice and then stopped. When I went to look for the package, it wasn't there. I called homicide and waited until they took him away. When I told Lieutenant Dundee what I had in mind, he congratulated me on my brilliant scheme and told me to go ahead with it. That was his mistake. I even talked them out of assigning any of these harness men to watch my building for the next couple of hours. That was my mistake. I went upstairs, opened the bottle, and waited for your knock on my door, Commodore. Hello, sir. A man would almost think you expected us. Keep a better eye on him, Clarence. Don't let him get to lured. Aye, sir. Welcome aboard. No time to scuttle about Mr. Spade. We are bound for Bullilong Bali on the car from Maru, sailing at dawn. I want that cup. The true, the genuine, the Baffio cup. No more deceptions, no more trickery. You will hand it over without further delay. Sure. Be glad to. Oh, no. Not like that. You will tell Clarence where it is stowed, and Clarence will fetch it above deck. Why, you old barnacle. Theophilus never had his mitts on a genuine Baffio cup. Huge water, sir. When Theophilus landed in San Francisco, he didn't have a farthing. Now he owes half a million dollars. If he hadn't got the genuine cup, how could he have borrowed all that money? Because a bunch of morons like you believed he had it. Lost my binnacles, man. You sound as though you believed what you're saying. Look, uh, Commodore, you're interested in high finance. Now, how did Ivor Kruger make his millions? Why, matches. 
He was the match king, sir. Uh, Matches had nothing to do with it, Commodore. He uh, started out with 15 million bucks worth of phony government bonds that he printed himself. Follow? They weren't even good counterfeits, but he was smart enough not to try and cash them. He just kept them in a safety deposit box and borrowed money. Theophilus uh, used his phony Vafio cup the same way. Lost my pinnacles, man. You sound as though you believe what you're saying. That has a familiar ring to it. I do. And I'll tell you why. He knew that that was the fake in the package when he held me up for it. He was willing to risk his own life to get it out of circulation. Dash my timbers. Old Theophilus has left us without a shot in the locker. You stared us onto the shoals. We're on our beam ends. Hey, turn them off, Commodore. You're pumping bilge flush. We better haul our wind. Yes, indeed. I'm afraid it's getting rather warm in San Francisco. Pull along, Beckham. You won't make it past the potato patch. What? The cops are going to want some answers about a couple of stiffs you left behind in San Francisco. I'm glad you reminded me. Can I plug him? No, no. We are taking him with us. Oh, that's what you think. Uh, take it easy, mate. Hey. This ain't going to hurt a bit. <laughs> a reek of chloroform filled the room and a fist pounded into my belly. It knocked my wind out and at the same time my nose collided with something wet and cold. I swung out but didn't connect. Before I could swing again, the room blurred and the ceiling light floated down to meet me. Then the lights went out altogether. At first, I couldn't figure it. It uh, sounded like what a doctor hears through a stethoscope or maybe an earthquake or maybe ship engines, which it turned out to be. When the lights came on again, I was lying on a bunk in a stateroom. I staggered across to the wash basin and splashed water in my face. Hello, you. Oh, Enid, as I hardly live and breathe. It could get worse. <sighs> yeah, where are we? Oh, not very far out. Not past the Farallon. Uh, good, I'm a stowaway and I'll put me off with of the pilot. Oh, no, you're not. Your passage is paid. Mine? It is, huh? It is. Do you know who you are? Who am I? Chester Brody. Then I'm dead. They'll bury me at sea. Roger. Who are you? I'm your widow. What's the score, widow? Chester and I booked passage on this ship a week ago. It was part of the plan. Chester and the Commodore worked it all out. Yeah, the cup was to have been stolen from me on the train. Yes, but when the Commodore discovered it was a fake, everything fell to pieces. Yeah, he thought Chester was double-crossing him. Hmm? They forced Chet to talk. He told them Dimitri still had the genuine Vafio cup and had hired you for the double-cross. Maybe he really believed it. Anyway... They killed Dimitri. Yeah. Well, there's nothing on them yet. But uh, you're a material witness, sweetheart, to at least one of the killings. That's extraditable. When that dawns on them, they'll uh, scuttle you, too. It's already dawned on them. I'm, I'm desperate. Yes, I notice. For you, you're practically hysterical. We have to face facts. Yeah, well, give me a couple to face right now. Where are the Commodore and Clarence? Up on the bridge. Good. All you have to do is walk straight up to the captain. He'll put him under arrest. Well, that might be a good idea, darling. Only... Only what? Only the Commodore is the captain. That tore it. Your uh, salty talk had fooled me, Commodore. I never dreamed that you were really an old sea dog, and I do mean dog. But two can play at that game. From my own intimate knowledge of Sea Story magazines, I realized that all hands would be turned to in the cargo gear, and the crew quarters would be, therefore, empty. In more time than it takes to tell... Enid and I had fitted ourselves out in dungarees, jumpers, and watch caps and turned to with them. Anybody coming here? Get around on the hill! You to hell and all! You left! Come walking out the bus behind us! You two, look alive! Stow that preventer! Oh, me? You uh, may recall, Commodore, you may recall me as the man who ran for a fire extinguisher when the bosun yelled, Stow the preventer. But experience is the best teacher, and by the time we hove to to put the pilot over the side, things were in such a state of confusion that you had retreated to your cabin with a quadruple ration of grog. Seizing that moment, I threw Enid over the side, yelled, Man overboard! And jumped in after him. Once safely aboard the pilot schooner, we revealed our true identity, and a merry laugh was enjoyed by all. It uh, dropped us at the foot of Margaret, and we waved warm farewells to our erstwhile rescuers, then to the snug haven of my office in a friendly cup, if you'll pardon the expression, in the grateful warmth of a gas radiator. Hmm. Unhealthy. <sighs> Who, me? Gas fumes. 
Why don't you move into a building with steam heat? I, I like this building. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been here for a long time. You don't make much money, do you? You don't have to rub it in. It's a living. <laughs> you happy? Mm-hmm. Sure I am. I guess. Well, I guess it's all right then. <clears throat> you know, sweetheart, uh, mm-hmm. there's uh, something missing in you. Oh, what? Uh, I don't know. And then how do you know? Forget it. Well, I guess I'll go. Do you, uh, do you mind if I don't see you to the door? Why should I? Well... <laughs> hey, you are human. Yeah, they're wet. Go ahead, sweet. I cry on you one. It's been tough. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't have kept it bottled up this long. No, it, it, it's not what you think. Well, what is it? It's you. You're so nice. I'm nice. Yeah, but you're no place. You never will be. And neither will I. And that, Commodore, is the cargo. It was nice seeing you again down at the hall. They uh, tell me you and Clarence are both trying to turn state's evidence. But according to the late bulletins, Clarence was leading by a neck in the stretch. Get it? The DA was afraid the jury might not understand your salty talk. Period. End of sea chanty. Oh, Sam. Yes, what, what, what? Oh, Hmm? Well, I just can't. I, oh, why I can't, can't you? Are, are you feeling okay, F? Oh, Sam. Hmm? You betrayed your trust. You... Effie, speak oh. to me. What is it? What is it? I betrayed my trust. What, what? Well, those criminals were on that boat. Yes. And you... You jumped overboard. You feel that I was recalcitrant? Is that it? That my actions were not true blue, clear cut? Is that it? Oh, I'll just go type this up, and I'm sure you can explain. I hope you can. I hope. Sour racket. Question. What's the easiest and best way there is to give your hair that well-groomed look? Answer. Wild root cream oil. Yes, non-alcoholic wild root cream oil with soothing lanolin gives you the advantages considered most important in a hair tonic. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. Call at your drug or toilet goods counter tonight or first thing tomorrow for wild root cream oil. If you've never tried it before, get the generous new 25-cent bottle just introduced. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of wild root cream oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Oh, here it is, Sam. I hope the spelling is all right. I was so upset. You hate me, then? Oh, no. No. I suppose it's foolish going along thinking that your ideal doesn't have feet of clay. Oh, Sam, I, I, I just can't. I just can't imagine. Don't you think? Don't you think I can explain that? Oh, yes, I'm sure you can explain. But you did. You deserted your post and jumped overboard like a thinking rat. That's right. Oh, Sam, that's so unlike you. It was just by chance they were apprehended. By chance, you say? Who do you think it was that got himself shot out of a torpedo tube in that submarine? You, Sam? No, you think I'm crazy? I <laughs> did something few radio detectives ever do, sweetheart. I called the harbor patrol single-handed using only one nickel and had them picked up. Oh. Sam, I wish I'd been there. Well, it was just a small phone booth. Besides, if you'd been there, it would have been out of order or something. Oh, Sam, you came through after all. Aren't you ashamed that you ever doubted me? Yes, I am. I'm a fool. There, there, there. I forgive you. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Rene Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first.
This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get wild root cream oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get wild root cream oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get wild root right. Away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, this just continues to be such a funny series at this point. The initial client interview was just hilarious. And I'm always up for one of those, they would think if we think, but then they would do, you know, that sort of uh, thing, which is just great. And there are some great lines uh, that work throughout. So this is another really fun episode. The scene at the end with Enid actually is very subtly done, but I think provides some insight into Sam's character, as well as into other old-time radio detectives and why they don't fall into temptations of corruption. Because, of course, Sam has many vices. It showed one of his uh, virtues, which is that he is contented with his lot in life, as his uh, being happy with the gas radiator shows. No, he doesn't romanticize it, and he is not effusive in talking about how wonderful it is. He knows it's a challenging and sometimes unpleasant profession. But he ex is accepted that and that's what he wants to do with his life. And so the reason that you can have people, you know, dragging all of these crossless treasures and putting them, you know, under his nose or telling him, you know, how valuable it is and how wealthy it could be and he still ends up doing the right thing. That's not the type of wealth he uh, aspires to. Yeah, he'll get as much as he can out of a case because he's got to keep the wolves from the door and he might go run through a cold streak any time. But he understands he's a detective and that's what he does. And when detectives go corrupt, you know, particularly in fiction, it's because they decide they're not content and want something much bigger or grander. We played an episode of Johnny Dollar a few months back where a friend of Johnny's went bad because he decided that he needed to impress a very wealthy woman and that being an insurance man was no longer enough. And I like the reason that Enid left the apartment. Because she's one of those characters who wants more and is willing to do a lot to get it. Uh, the story makes clear that she was a bad girl, but she didn't do anything illegal, even if it was immoral. But the reason it would never work with Sam is because Sam isn't willing to do anything for money or status. He's settled in his life, and so she'll find someone else to continue her self-destructive uh, pursuit of wealth with. Listener comments and feedback, and uh, we have this from Saysoft, who writes on YouTube, I'm with Bernadine. I also hate to appear lucid. Thanks for the comment, Saysoft. And then we have this from Dory, who writes, My all-time Sam Spade is Howard Duff with his innate humor and right on uh, comedic timing. Missing that, the rest pale in comparison. Thanks for the comment, Dory. And an interesting point. It does kind of depend on what you're looking for in the program. Now, certainly Humphrey Bogart's portrayal of Sam Spade in the film 
didn't really have a whole lot of humor in it, but I think that the intensity of the film portrayal isn't something that you could uh, sustain in a week-in and week-out radio series. And Duff's style and his humor really are uh, something to behold. Now, after Howard Duff, we will have the tenure of Steve Dunn. And I think that there are probably very few people who would say in terms of iconic portrayals that Dunn is anywhere near as good as Howard Duff. However, I have uh, read some reviewers praise the fact that Steve Dunn's run it feels a bit more grounded and hard-boiled with less of the comedy, so it does kind of depend what you're looking for. But thanks so much for the comment, Dory, and now it is time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Glenn, Patreon supporter since... August of 2021, currently supporting the program at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Glenn. And that will actually do it for today. A reminder, if you are not subscribed to the podcast, you can subscribe using your favorite uh, software, whether it's Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, or Amazon Music at Amazon.com slash OTR Detectives. Also, I do encourage you to rate and review this podcast wherever you get your podcast from. We'll be back next Monday with another episode of Sam Spade. But coming up tomorrow, listen for I Hate Crime, where... While I was waiting... Hey! Hello, sport! These seat cushions ain't comfortable. My sudden passenger was that celebrated cab, truck, tram, and bus jumper, Lucy Kelso. She wore an old army coat, army shoes, a sun visor. She wore her hair. Well. All right, sport. Come on, come on. Move your way through the mob. Blow the horn. All right, if you want. Hey, stop that. Hey, get away from that horn. Do you want to get me pinched? Move aside, mugs. Let us through. Come on, get this heap out of here unless you want me to ship those gears okay, for you. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's better. Uh, which way are you, are you going, Lucy? Home. Well, if home's on the way, I'll drop you in. You're coming in with me. Look, you've got yourself a ride. Fine. Now let it go at that. Don't force me to hand you over to a cop. Cop? <laughs> I know all the cops. All the magistrates, too. Nice blokes. But I hear you don't get along very well with them. Kent? Well, fame at last. I know who you are. And I've been waiting to see you. I have business with you, Kent. Important business. Well, you sound almost... Normal? <laughs> sure. But I really am. Normal businesswoman. Now, take me home and I'll tell you what... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.